infinite complacency. People went to and fro of the earth about their little affairs, serene in the assurance of their dominion over this small, binning fragment of solar driftwood, which by chance or design, man has inherited out of the dark mystery of time and space. On this edition of Into the Fray, I welcome on with me listener and author Mel Murphy. She wrote in to me about an encounter, it was 40 plus years ago, when she was around 11 years old, that occurred in rural northern Nevada. Now Mel, I don't know how much of this you want to cover, but I think that it has a place and it's worth mentioning here, and that is your, besides, I said you're an author, You guys go check her out on on Amazon, Mel Murphy. Is your professional background, because you mentioned a couple of different things that you have done in the past, and I think that considering what we're about to talk about, that maybe we should uh, bring that up. And welcome on, by the way. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thanks, Shannon. Yeah, I originally went to school to be a newspaper reporter because I, I really like to be behind the curve and start out in professions that are about to completely go out of business. <laughs> so I did that I did that in the 90s. I, I went to school in Reno and studied to do that. And then I, I wrote for a couple of newspapers and I got it. I was all done with it by like 2000. And then it, during that, I actually took a break from it in 1996. Uh, I worked for the U.S. Forest Service. I was a wildland firefighter on the east side of the Plumas National Forest. Um, I was on an engine crew stationed. Uh, we were actually at the Frenchman Lake workstation. And I did that for, I think it was, the season usually runs about four months. And then uh, I went back and tried working for the Forest Service again in 2003. And that time I was on a, uh, a timber marking crew. I always tell people Southern Colorado, but technically it was like, central Colorado, because our, our main station that we were out of was Grand Junction, Colorado, but our, our barracks were in Paonia, which is a town you would have a lot of trouble finding on a map. And then our duty station was Delta, Colorado. So I worked for the U.S. Forest Service twice. And like I said, I was a newspaper reporter and I had to cover news stories regarding People getting like like the situation going on right now in Southern California uh, with the actor Julian Sands. I occasionally covered stories like that, and so I kind of think I've got kind of a level-headed view on all of that. And that this is not not to diss anybody, but I have kind of a level-headed view on certain aspects of the Sasquatch phenomenon. Like when people tell stories about, you know, my friend, he went hiking and he went hiking in this park and this national forest and he'd been there a hundred times and they disappeared and they never found anything. And well, I'm sorry to tell you this, but there's probably a 95% chance that your friend slipped and fell and hit his head and fell down a ravine or a canyon and his body was never recovered. And that's the simple truth. And, and, and a lot of people don't want to hear that. We, we seem to have, human beings seem to be hardwired to want to find or go looking for the most sensational, the most metaphysical, the most supernatural answer when a lot of times it's just the most obvious thing. And like this actor right now that they're looking for down there, uh, I think that's part of Angeles National Forest, you know. I'm sorry, but he, I, I don't know if he was a trail runner. He kind of looked like one of the people that, you know, a lot of people in L.A. are like really into uber fitness and 
hiking is not enough for them. They got to run and slip and fall. Yeah. And I, I actually had a really good slip and fall hiking. I used to hike all the time in the Eastern Sierras and I had a really good slip and fall in, uh, 1999 when I was still living in Reno and, uh, I could have freaking died. I went off a trail that was within sight of Northwest Reno. I mean, like you could, you could be standing in the Canyon. You could see the edge of Northwest Reno. I was in Hunter Creek Canyon and there was a slippery granite rock and I lost my footing and I landed on this sort of, uh, I want to say a, a pebble or a granite scree. Well, it was a pebble scree, you know, it was like a loose fall of like pebbles and dirt. And I slid 10 feet to the edge of a cliff. And the cliff was probably a 20 or 20 or 30 foot drop Ugh. to rocks. And if I had not grabbed on to a piece of sagebrush, I would have gone, I, I would, it would have killed me. I would have gone. And this guy tried to get me off the scree and then he brought more of it down on time. We both almost went off the cliff and there was, you know, there was people around and everything. It was, it was pretty scary, but like I said, it, it, it can happen in a second. Yeah, and it doesn't take um, much for your mortality right. to all of a sudden uh, be you're punched right. in the face with it, essentially. And so, yeah, you bring up Julian right. Sands, and I've always remembered him from, like, very cliche, of course I'm going to say this, but from leaving Las Vegas. Uh, he was really good in that. Uh, he did not play a good guy in yeah, that Yeah, the, but... Russian, the Russian, uh, what was he, the, the pimp? He was I the think? pimp, yeah. yeah. Yeah, he was good. And yeah. I know he's he's been in a lot of other things, but I've been trying to keep an eye on that story. And unfortunately, it's it's not looking good for him. And, and they've said that Mount Baldy yeah. is not a it, it's it can be a treacherous place to go even just hiking. And as you say, if he's one of these trail runners when hiking, simply walking slash hiking is not enough. A lot of bad right. things can happen very quickly. So that's an unfortunate situation. I just my personal attitude is most of the time. It's not a herd of wild rattlesnakes. It's not a, a bunch of ravenous mountain lions. It's not a cryptid. You slip, you fall, you hit your head. And that's the truth. I, when I, one of my, one of my earliest jobs in uh, 1995, I was, I worked for a company that I don't think is in existence anymore. They were called Chalfont Publishing. They were out of Bishop, California, which is the top end of Owens Valley. And I worked, they had, they, they had the Inyo Register, which is still in print in Bishop, but I don't know if they own it. And then they had another teeny tiny little newspaper in uh, Mammoth Lakes, California, that was called the Mammoth Lakes Herald. And I was one of the reporters there. And to give you an idea of how long ago this was, and also they were a little behind the times, so they didn't have like a ticker tape or anything, but they had a couple of really ancient fax machines. And the U.S. Park Service and the U.S. Forest Sur Service sent us releases, press releases, once or twice a week. And one of the things I had to cover was there was a, a, a little, like a news column in the Mammoth Lakes Herald, and I'm, I'm trying to remember what called i want to say it was called yosemite news or something like that and so the park service in yosemite would send us these faxes and it was a steady torrent torrent of so and so of bakersfield california slipped fell down an embankment you know shattered his hip took search and rescue crews out of Sacramento County and two helicopters, you know, five hours to get him out of where he was. And 18 year old boys slipped, fell, died. Park officials are saying they may have been drinking. Alcohol may have been involved. I must've written, I don't know, 20 or 30 of those yeah, in the time that I was there. And the editor that I had, my editor at the time at the Mammoth Lakes Herald, she she probably did a hundred a thousand, and that this and I'm saying this I'm not saying I don't believe. I I loved what Les Stroud said when he called them the phenomenon. I'm not saying I don't believe in this kind of stuff. I do, but I think most of the time, sadly, it's just the most simplest answer. But I used to see that all the time, and I, boy, I. When I hear about people, a, a lot of guys wanting to get armed for bear, that you know, 
the deer hunting rifle isn't enough. They got to get thoroughly and they're going to go out. And they, these are people that usually spend, you know, they're like me, they spend a lot of their time in front of their TV or whatever, or their computer. And they're going to go out and they're going to go hiking and they're going to stress themselves physically in a way they don't normally do. And they're going to be carrying weapons. And I just think, oh, wow, just, you know, let me know which park you're going to be in or forest you're going to be in, because I don't want to be within 10 miles of you yeah. when you slip and fall. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think, Anyhow. I think that can go for a lot of folks that go out there armed, right? They maybe could use a little touch more uh, time with said weapon. Yeah, just, well, and safety. And just, you know, I they had a... The first time I worked for the Forest Service in 1996, they had this old VHS tape that was like 30 minutes long. And I think they finally retired them because the time when I went back in 2003 and worked for the Forest Service in, on uh, down in central Colorado, they had retired them by then. But they had this old these old videos that they showed everybody called A Walk in the Forest. And it was about how to walk when there's no trail. And how to hike and walk in the woods. And, and it was shocking the number of people that go out into the wilderness and they don't realize. Uh, and like the whole Julian Sands thing, I was actually at a public park where I live in Spokane. Uh, it's about five miles north of town. I was at this public park, which has a, a really pretty trail. And I hadn't been on it in like three or four years, had a bunch of health issues and stuff. I was on it for the first time. I, I drove out there and, and, you know, we've still got snow on the ground in the shade here. And I, and it was, it starts out, the trail starts out wide enough for the uh, Washington, uh, what is it, Department of Resources to drive their trucks up it. And I got about not even block up this trail and the snow was sort of icy. And then there were parts that had melted and it hadn't melted and it was just, and it was treacherous. And I didn't have my cleats on. I didn't have my ice cleats on. And I just turned around and walked back because I was like, I was looking up at it and I'm like, okay, that's the part where it veers out over the Spokane River and there is a cliff. And I'm like, no, I'm not, I'm not doing it. I'm not going to slip and fall <laughs> and become another statistic. Well, yeah. And, and one question for you before we dive into your experience is during your time with the Forest Service, did the word Bigfoot ever come up for any reason whatsoever if you wanted to get laughed out of the room if you wanted to get laughed out of the barracks i i remember because i was 31 the first time i did it in 1996 and i remember i i was in these barracks like a week and i pulled this one guy aside and i said i said have you ever seen anything and he looks at me and he's like what you mean like bigfoot he's like no he said the only thing you're gonna see is bugs he said, you're not going to believe how many bugs, and, and he was right. And I I remember that spring in the eastern Sierra, we got we got mauled for a little bit by the mosquitoes, but they, because it's so much drier in the eastern Sierra, they had eased off by like, I'd say like by June. When I was in Colorado, when I was in central Colorado, I actually, this one tiny fire that I went on, I had a squad boss, and it was, she was a female, she was uh, what do I want to say? She was a former hot shot and she was in this promotion program and stuff. And, but she had been a hot shot up in Alaska for like two or three seasons. And I taught everybody I talked to in 2003 said to me, and I knew someone that had lived in Florida. I knew people that had lived in swamps that were working on that, on that forest. And they all said the same thing. The mosquitoes here are the worst I've ever seen. And it stayed that way until like, I want to say the first week of September. But yeah, it was just no Bigfoot. But, but I, it's weird because since looking back on, you know, having listened to a lot of podcasts, having read like Max Brooks' book, and I, I love Max Brooks' book. It's great. I don't agree with it, but it's fun. It's a really fun read. But now that I know, now that I've listened to some, some Sasquatch podcasts, I did see stuff, particularly when I was in Colorado, but I didn't see any Bigfoot, but like, you know, like the upside down trees, like Stroud had talked about in his Survivor Man Bigfoot. I must have seen six of those over the course of the summer. 
But, you know, we were so busy with our paint guns and slapping paint on the trees and doing our chaining and getting through the trees and marking the trees and going on to the next site. I, I didn't, I just, I, 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 and I, I remember one time we had one of our, one of our, our pickups for the paint crew was part, maybe 10 feet away from one of those upside down trees. And it was big. And I, I remember somebody, I remember one of my supervisors just saying, oh, that's just, it's, it's snow melt. It's just the snow runoff and it, these old trees, it rips them up by the roots and it flips them over. And I was like, oh, okay, that's really weird. And didn't think much of it. Uh, I did spend the very end of my season in uh, September, or let's see, end of August, like last week of August, first week of September. The, the forest I worked on was called G-Mug, Grand Mesa Uncompagre Gunnison National Forest. So it's three national forests combined, and they are based out of Grand Junction. And there was the last two weeks we worked it was just me and my barracks roommate, and they sent us up onto the Grand Mesa. As beautiful as all of that country was, I have no desire to go back. I'd like to go back and see the Colorado National Monument. That was gorgeous. But the Grand Mesa was weird. The Paiutes or the Utes that lived in that area had, I didn't, I wasn't familiar with all of the stories, but I heard a few stories about it. Just essentially the cliff notes was that the Ute or Paiute Indians in that area, in the, in the Grand Junction area, traditionally never hunted on the Grand Mesa. The Grand Mesa is exactly what it sounds like. It's a gigantic mesa. The west side of it, which we were at, goes from about, I think it goes from about five or 6,000 feet to I want to say 8,900 or 9,000. So we were almost actually at the 10,000 foot, you know, which is where technically if you're into mountain climbing, that is what they refer to as the death zone. Uh, you go 10,000 feet to 14,000 feet, which was, they have a lot of those in Colorado. That's a dangerous, there are people, there are Olympic athletes go and hike at that altitude and they still die. It's just, there's so little air and the altitude sickness can do very weird things to your head. But we ended up at this bear. Well, it was a camp. It was a campsite. It was a Forest Service campsite. And there was an elderly couple that had been taking care of it. And they were leaving when we showed up. And there was like three little cabins. And then there was this one really big cabin with this old like army surplus bank blankets and these old, old, I mean, from the 50s and 60s hospital beds. And it was just a big open barrack. We stayed there and it's weird. I remember that my, my barracks roommate, Jared, he was like, he's like, I don't like it up here. And I was like, I don't either. And there was a, there was a lake right next to us. And we walked, I remember we got home the first night at like seven o'clock and, you know, the sun was going down and we had, we had done our section for the day and we were just all by ourselves. We weren't with our crew. Our crew had gone on a different fire. They had all gotten called up. To join a hand crew we were just standing there at that lake and i was like it's so quiet and he was like where are all the birds and there there was no birds there was no mosquitoes which was the only upside to it and it was just this weird quiet and we had seen elk we had encountered uh colorado elk are basically the size of horses and we had seen so many elk on the Gunnison. There were almost none where we were at. And I, 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 at the time, I just talked it up to the, the altitude. That maybe just the animals just didn't like being at that altitude. I don't know. But I mean, even during the day, I remember we went like the day later, we went over to the area we were supposed to go mark. And we had to take. Uh, spruce beetle samples. We had to get these core samples and give those to the people that were on the bug crew. We were just walking around and it was just, I mean, you could hear a pin drop. I mean, there was nothing but the wind and we had these really unreliable early Garmin GPS that we had to use. And the one Garmin GPS said we were at 9,217 feet. 
above sea level. That's really high. Again, I didn't see any tracks. I, I did see one or two of those, those weird upside down trees. And there was a lot of uh, old aspen growth there. There's like, there's like aspen trees on the Grand Mesa that were there when the pioneers came out in the 1800s. And aspen trees don't generally live more than 100 years or so. And some of these things were just enormous. Uh, and we would go through these aspen stands and it would, you know, it would be stunning. The leaves were just starting to turn blue sky, but quiet. I mean, you could hear nothing. So that's it. That's all I saw or heard. Yeah, some of those places, <laughs> they just are flat out weird. And yeah, you're like, hey, is it the altitude? Like what what exactly is going on here? But who knows? Um, And by the way, that is a great slogan for that area that you were speaking of. It's called no Bigfoot, just bugs. That's a great slogan for that place, right? That, that'll that keep a few people out at least because I've, I've experienced um, Skeeters Love Me, unfortunately. I've always said as, as much as I love the show Naked and Afraid, I don't think I could deal with the bugs. Yeah, yeah. We, we ended up by, I think it was by like July because the Forest Service loves to not pay you for the first six weeks that you work and the assumption is you will just live on air uh, but I remember when we'd both gotten like a couple of paychecks and I had lost a ton of weight, we drove to Grand Junction and got the Carhartt, the double layer jeans, because mm-hmm. if you didn't have those on, if you had like regular, like casual street je- blue jeans, they would bite right through them. Yeah, they were horrid. They were really horrid. <laughs> it's like a, a horrendous subspecies of a regular Skeeter is what it sounds like. Well, yeah, Mel, let's dive in here. So let's go back uh, to 1976, shall we? I was born in Carmel, California. Um, my parents divorced when I was about four. And uh, I had two older brothers. And my dad, the assumption was my father was going to raise them. My mom was like, well, she's the youngest. I'll take her. So we bounced around a bit and we ended up in Reno, Nevada. And my mom worked for a health department in Reno for a little while. That she took she she you know she was she was a single divorced working mother and it's really hard it was really hard in the 60s and 70s to re- return to the workforce over the age of 40. So she took a whole battery of tests. She scored really well on a uh, I, I can't remember if she called them civil servant job tests, something like that. And she was offered a job as a an office clerk, basically, with the Bureau of Land Management in Battle Mountain. My mother and I had never been to rural Nevada. I mean, we, we just knew Reno. That was it. And we had, we had a vague idea of where Las Vegas was. That was it. So... When we first, you know, we took out a road map and we looked at it and we were like, oh, it's all green here. It's in the Tyalbi National Forest. Maybe it'll be like Lake Tahoe. And we got there when I, the summer I turned 10 and I remember crying the first time I saw it. It was so ugly. It was just so ugly. You know, my, my mom had a good job there. I think she was making like, six or seven dollars an hour which in the 1970s was a lot of money at, at least for us we bought a mobile home i've got to kind of talk about the mobile home a little bit because it's it's sort of important to the story to the layout of the story to what happened to where i think this thing came from to how i think it got in and how i think it got out um So we bought this mobile home. It was a single wide, but it had a dropout. It was already on the lot. And I lived there with my mother from the time I was 10 until the summer I turned 14 when we left. So I went all through junior high school in Battle Mountain. You know, I was I was all the euphemisms. I was a latchkey kid. I was raised by a single working mother. And then when I became a teenager, I was an at risk youth. I was all the euphemisms. So we move into this mobile home and we were there about a year uh, when this happened. The mobile home was laid out roughly. We were were inside the city limits. I don't even know if it was an incorporated city of Battle Mountain. We were on a rented lot. 
And so the mobile home was roughly on an east-west thing. So our front door faced roughly south. And our front yard was roughly to the south. When you opened the front door and went in, the dining room and the kitchen was in the east. And the bedrooms, my mother's master bedroom and mine were to the west, down the hallway. So one night, it was either summer or late fall or early fall. I remember this because I was only, I only had a, a, blank, a, a very light blanket and a, and a sheet on my bed. And if it had been any other time of year, I would have been under like 35 blankets because, as you know, the Great Basin gets incredibly cold in the winter time. I would sleep with the curtains in my bedroom all, all the way open or part way open because in the Great Basin and, and also down in the Mojave, when you have even a partial, partial moon, it's like daylight. So there'd be, you know, that blue white light from from uh, from the outside found asleep in bed one night I my bed it was a, it was a little kid's twin bed and the head of it was just to the west of the window so I wasn't right under the window I was I was to the left of it and or, well to the west of it and there was there was a wall so my bed was sort of pushed up against the wall lengthwise and the foot of it was towards the door of my bedroom. I was asleep in my bedroom. I'm pretty sure that my bedroom door was closed because my mother was a smoker and I hated cigarette smoke. I had asthma as a kid and all the stuff that goes with being raised by a smoker. So doors closed, curtains are open. I'm sound asleep. And my face was turned towards that wall that my bed was pushed sideways up against. I woke up, which was weird because my mom always told me I slept like wood. Uh, that I was just, she had a hard time getting me up to her. I just slept really hard. I woke up. I don't know why I woke up. It was unusual. And I felt something kind of pushing or rubbing against my right forearm. I thought, you know what? And my first thought, and at this time, the first year that we lived there, first yeah, at the first year, first year and a half, we had a dog. We had a black standard poodle named Corky. But Corky always, almost without exception, was on a leash in his dog bed in the kitchen, which was at the east end of the trailer. So I'm half asleep and I thought Corky was in my room because I, I felt something warm and very furry sort of rubbing against my right arm and I strain, not really awake. And I turned my head and this thing's face was maybe 12 inches from my face. It was either crouched down or kneeling down next to my bed. I think it was crouched down. Thinking back on it now, I think it was maybe between five and six feet tall. I want to say probably about closer to five. It was completely covered in short, thick black fur, like a gorilla's, like a lowland gorilla's fur. The kind of fur that's like, I, I don't know if you've ever you've probably seen them like when, you know, the movies and stuff of lowland gorillas, their, their fur is sort of, uh, it's so dense. It's like on their heads. It almost looks like a, like a buzz haircut, right. like a Marine's haircut. That's, that's how its fur kind of was. Its nose was pretty Caucasian looking normal nose. It was, it was straight. I don't know. I don't remember it being exceptionally wide or narrow. I do remember that I could see light colored skin on the bridge of it, underneath it. I don't remember it having what I call a muzzle, like chimpanzees do and like gorillas do. You know, they have kind of a muzzle. They've got a real prominent jaw, but they also have a really prominent upper palate. So their, their mouth kind of sticks out a little bit from their face. Didn't have that. It was, it was a very, I, I would say, Structurally, it was 
pretty similar to a human's, uh, except that the mouth was very wide and it had very thin lips. It had its left arm resting on my bed and its left forearm was up against my right forearm. And it was just, it was just sitting there. And, and, you know, and I want to preface by saying there was nothing creepy or gropey or pervy or sexual, none of that. It was just, it was like sitting, it was crouched down with its arm resting next to mine, very intently watching me. And when I turned in that split second and looked at it, its facial expression was unmistakable. Its facial expression was, oh, she's awake. And it was like surprised. Its eyes were completely human. They were brown eyes. I, I could see the whites, you know, uh, around them. I remember seeing just a glimpse of teeth. They were, they were flat. They kind of uniform. Right in that moment, right in that three seconds, when I registered that this thing was crouched down in my room next to my bed, it sort of like broke my 11-year-old's brain. I mean, I sort of just snapped. And it, I, the only thing I can think of is it's as though there was a gigantic billboard inside my head with bright red flashing lights that started flashing this should not be here. This should not be here. And it was like a computer loop. It was like my brain went on this loop of this should not be here. This should not be here. And I couldn't stand it. And I, I was not a girly girl. I was a tomboy. I was not somebody that would do this. But I turned my head away because something told me I can't keep looking at this. I just can't. And I grabbed my sheet and I put it up, not over my head, but just in front of my face because I just couldn't look at this thing. I couldn't. I couldn't comprehend its existence, let alone its existence in my room. And I started screaming. And, you know, little girls and little boys do this too. They, if you've ever had kids, they, they've got a scream that's like an air raid siren. I started screaming and screaming and screaming and screaming. I, I actually almost lost my voice. I screamed so much. I was screaming and it... I, I want to say about 30 seconds might even been, it might even have been a full minute. They screamed that long. And then I like ran out of breath for a second and I had to stop and like, you know, catch my breath. And something in me said, it's okay. It's a nightmare. Turn your head. It'll be gone. And I, I wanted to believe that more than anything in the world. And so I lowered the right side with my right hand. I lowered the, the sheet a little bit and I turned my head partway to the right. And that was when I caught it standing up. I could only see it from the side. Again, it was black fur all over it, like a chimpanzee's, but, but thicker so that I couldn't really see skin. It was lean. I don't remember it being especially muscular. I could see its left arm. It had a very lean left arm, and I could see its left hip. I could see the left side of its head. I think it had ears, but I couldn't really see them. I did see that the head was kind of almost, well, the way a gorilla's forehead and the crown of their head is shaped, kind of like that, sort of. Not really con conical, but kind of. I just, and then I just snapped again. I was just like, and, and some part of, you know, my 11 year old mind was like, oh shit, it's real. <laughs> I heard very quickly, I heard click, click. And it sounded like when our poodle would walk across the linoleum. I heard that very quickly. I think I heard my door open. And all of that happened, like me turning my head to the side, seeing it stand. And when it moved, it was sort of like its shoulders and its head were hunched forward. Like, like if you were crossing a street in Seattle and you were like hunched down and the wind and the rain was, it was like that. So I don't know really how tall it was because I don't know if it was standing all the way up straight. I just, I just, that whole period of time for me glancing over, seeing it stand up and hearing it 
you know, go across the floor and out the door was maybe five seconds, maybe 10 seconds. Put my head back under the sheet and I went back to screaming. Then I heard this loud crashing noise and my mother opening her door and I think she knocked a lamp over in her bedroom. She was in the master bedroom. So she was at the far west end of the trailer. And she comes in and flips on the overhead light and oh moms you know she had she had raccoon eyes she had mascara snared from one eye to the other and she's standing there in her house coat and she's like honey what's wrong you know and she's like just sound asleep and her kid just woke her up with like this air raid scream she flicked on the light she couldn't get me to stop screaming and she told me later and she told a couple of her friends later, she said her face was whiter than the sheet she was holding up. She said her eyes were the size of dinner plate. And she said, and when I sat down next to her on the edge of the bed, she jerked away from me. And she said, and it was like she couldn't even see me. She just kept staring straight ahead. And I remember my mom trying to pull the sheet down from the front of my face and me jerking it back up. And this is after the lights on. And this thing's gone. It took her a while. I think she had to shake me by the shoulders or something to get me to stop. She got me out to the living room, sat me down on the sofa. And she went into the kitchen, turned on the light of the dining room nook, turned on the light in the kitchen. Our dog, Porky, was sound asleep in his dog bed. And I remember my mother saying, that damn dog, I can't believe he slept through that. And and then she joked to some friends later. She said, I can't believe the dog slept through that racket. She said, I sure didn't. <laughs> she came out and she sat down her chair and she said, honey, what's wrong? What happened? What happened? And I said, mom, there was something in my room. There was something in my room. And I was like screaming it. And she said, you had a nightmare. You had a bad. No, there was something in my room. And I was adamant. I mean, I was adamant i knew it in my bones this was not a ghost this was not a demon this was not my imagination this this did not behave this did not feel like something that was conjured up by my subconscious didn't feel like that at all so she gets up at one point and i was like where are you going where are you going and i was like mom finish turning all the lights on and she said i'm just going to go back to the bedroom i'm going to go get my cigarette and I said, well, turn the lights on. And she said, the lights on. I said, make sure they're all on. And so she walked back down the hallway, made sure my light in my bedroom was on, made sure the light in the hallway was on. She went into her kitchen, uh, into the, excuse me, into her bedroom, got her cigarettes. She turned around and I, and I had my back to her. So I didn't see it and I didn't know about it. She didn't tell me about it for, I, I think it was at least a day or so. What she told me later was that, she, so we had, when you went down this hallway in this trailer, pretty tr typical trailer, my bedroom was the first door you, you saw on the left. And then the second door on the left was our, our bathroom, which was actually a pretty big bathroom. And then there was my mother's master bedroom. And then on the right-hand side, right across from the door to the bathroom was a back door. And the back door opened on these really rickety wooden steps, there were three really scruffy looking elm trees that were along the north side of our mobile home. And there was this really rickety six foot tall wooden fence. And then there was a vacant lot with sagebrush on the other side of that. And what she told me a couple of days later was that when she walked back past the back door, it was unlocked. And I flipped when she, I remember, I think we were in the car or something too. And she, I was like, what? And she said, she said, it's nothing to worry about. She said, I just I forgot to lock it apparently. And so there was like a button lock on this thing, but there were also really heavy, I mean, heavy brass sliding chain locks on the back door and also on our front door. It was unlocked completely, but the door, I guess, was closed. I didn't see it. My mom was the one that made sure it was locked. And she came back out. She said, 
you know, she sat down, she's like, she's like, honey, you need to calm down. And she said, that's it. No more TV. You're not watching. And, and we, you know, we didn't even have cable back then. So I would get like, I would get like a uh, six million dollar man, but it was like the kind of situation where you had to hold the rabbit ears in a piece of aluminum foil. <laughs> it wasn't real clear pictures, you know. I would we would occasionally watch stuff like that, but I mostly either was playing with my friends outside, building forts, what have you. So we didn't watch that much TV. We heard a knock at the door, and we got up. And my mom got up and went and opened the door and it was the only other mobile home that was next to us was this woman Cheryl and her two kids and I went to junior high school with her two kids one of them was a year younger than me and one was the same age as I was was in the same grade with me Cheryl our neighbor was an LPN at that point and worked at the only hospital in Battle Mountain which was I think a trailer at the time she was standing there and she said, is everything okay? <laughs> you know, she's like, what's, what's going on? And I don't know what time of night this was. I, I want to say it was around one or two in the morning. She talked to my mom for a minute. And my mom said, oh, I, she had a bad dream or a nightmare. And she woke up screaming and I just got her calmed down. And I remember Cheryl saying to my mom, you know, if you want, I can give, you know, I can go get a sedative. I've got some, set, and I don't remember what it was she was recommending. And my mom said, you know, no, it's okay. I'll calm her down. She'll be all right. So she said good night to Cheryl. And then uh, I remember we sat up for about a half hour, mostly arguing. I remember shaking my head vigorously and saying, no, it was not a nightmare. It was not a dream. It was not a nightmare. Eventually, we went back to bed and that that resulted in me spending like, I don't know, the next three, four weeks sleeping with my mom in her queen size bed because it had scared me so bad. And there was no way. And I seem to I seem to remember making her turn on the bedroom light in my bedroom and leave it on <laughs> all night. I just wanted if I had to get up to use the bathroom, I wanted to make sure that light was on. It was just crazy. And and then there was some stuff that happened after that, like a year or two after that, that again, now having read a few books and listened to a bunch of podcasts, I'm wondering if the other stuff that happened, I don't know, it may or may not have been related, but that was it. I never saw this thing again. I did have a weird dream about two years later, maybe, I think we were still living there. I think so. I think I was like 13 or something. And I had this weird dream and it didn't scare me at all. And in the dream, I came home from school. It was during the day. So my mother was at work till 530. I came home and, you know, unlocked the door with my key and came in, threw my coat on the sofa. And I started back down the hallway and in the dream, that back door was wide open and I could see daylight streaming in. And this thing, that, that same thing, I could only see the back of it, sort of came pogoing out of my bedroom. And I don't know how else to describe it. It's sort of, what's that word? It's sort of parkoured down the hallway, you know, where people can like, their feet on one wall and put their hands on the other and just sort of bounce down the hallway and it in, in the dream it did that very quickly and then boom out that back door in, into broad daylight and I remember remembering the dream the next day and thinking that was really weird but I didn't feel scared I just remember kind of idly thinking I wonder if it was that picture that I saw that night and then thinking well it couldn't have been because it was just a dream and that was it. Okay, I have questions. Sure. All right, so uh, we've heard many times that Biggie is extremely interested in children, women, you know, things like that. And one of the biggest questions was, which you already answered, 
how much time did you spend outside? And you already said it could be a significant amount of time with your friends. You guys would build forts, et cetera, et cetera. So you were kind of out there maybe putting on a show for uh, something. Now, I'm sure you would have mentioned this, but I just wanted to make sure to ask it just in case. Looking back, did your forts ever get messed with, rearranged? Was there anything looking back that could be attributed to Sasquatch? And not just with your forts, just in general. Like, looking back, anything weird around the property? Weird stuff that happened around the property, not with the forts my friends and I built in the vacant lot. I should preface here, too, also, that we were the the little teeny tiny two trailer trailer park we were in was next to what at the time was well it was very close to the cemetery uh but before anybody gets excited you got to know this was the most boring saddest forest cemetery you ever saw it was literally a gravel lot i think there was one maybe true two cottonwood trees in it in the whole thing and there were these you know grave sites and that was to the south of us. So in other words, there was there was a chain link fence to the west of us, and that was the city cemetery. And it was big. It was like, I don't know how many acres it was. We'll say five. Most of the graves were to the south of us. So the west side where my mom's bedroom was did not look out on actual graves. It just looked out on a chain link fence. There was a gravel lot. And then way to the south of us, like a block, a half block away, were the actual graves. And we actually, myself and and Cheryl's kids, I remember we were so disappointed in it. Because we would like go over there and run around at night and dare each other. Oh, I dare you to jump over this headstone. I did. It was so boring. There was nothing there. There was like few scorpions to catch. That was it. And there wasn't there wasn't a gate or uh, anything on the the great the cemetery. You could go in there any time, and it was just it was just dull and poor. And so we would either play in the vacant lot on the other side of the wooden fence to the north of our mobile home. My friends and I would play out there, or we would sometimes. And I got in trouble for this on I think two or three occasions. I got in big trouble. We would ride our bikes to the edge of town, which in Battle Mountain was about three blocks. And then we would either leave our bikes or we would drag our bikes out into the sagebrush. And it was, there was, there was a fair amount of Montana big sage, which is, that stuff's about five, six feet tall. And we would run around in that. And we always went out there looking for badgers. I had a friend that had a can of gasoline that he had stolen. And if we found a badger hole, we were going to pour gasoline down it. And when the badger came out, we were going to put him in a gunny sack and make a friend out of him. You know, this is kids. We would try and shoot ground squirrels with pellet guns and just, you know, catch lizards or catch scorpions, that kind of thing. I, I, I recently watched that Spielberg film, I'm trying to remember that, The Fablemans, and like the scene where he's the Boy Scout and they're in they're in Arizona and they're talking about, well, if we get this many scorpions, we'll get this much money from that. And I'm sitting there watching that going, wait a minute, could have been making money with scorpions? <laughs> but yeah, I, I, I think there might have been one time When I went out with a couple of the neighborhood kids and we went to one of the forts, the wood had been kicked around or pulled up or anything, but I always assumed it was other kids in the neighborhood that we were, you know, squabbling with, you know, other 10-year-olds or 12-year-olds or whatever in the neighborhood, and they had come and stolen some of our wood, and they were trying to make their own fort in another vacant lot, that kind of thing. It never occurred to me. It never occurred to me to look for footprints. I didn't know anything about that. Right. I don't think I even heard the word Sasquatch until I was well into my 20s. Yeah, no problem. I was just wondering if now looking back, you're kind of like, oh, there was a weird, you know, whatever out in the woods. But 
there was other stuff that happened that I did not associate with it at all at the time. But now at age 57, I'm wondering if the other stuff that happened around our trailer had anything to do with it. So after that happened, I, I don't know, maybe a year or so, we got rid of the dog Corky. My mom rehomed him. The main reason she did that was because he wasn't fixed. Anytime we took him off the leash and we put him in the front yard, he jumped the fence and he would go for strolls along the interstate looking for girlfriends. And my mom got tired of having to get in the car and go retrieve him from who knows where. And we got, we got a cat. But a, around that time, so like Corky's gone, we've got a cat, and I'm like seventh or eighth grade. There were three or four times, maybe six times, when I would either be sitting in the breakfast nook at the table drawing, or I'd be in my room playing, and my mom would come running in, and be in this it was usually at night, and my mom would come running in, and she'd be like, did you hear that? Did you hear that? And I was like, what? And she's like, it sounds like somebody's on the roof. And I'm like, mom, it's just the wind. And I remember her having a discussion with our useless landlord at one point. And he was like, well, you know, go to a wrecking yard and get a bunch of old tires and put them on. And, you know, because I don't have to tell you about the windstorms of Nevada. They're infamous. But that, that happened. I, I distinctly remember at least three or four, four times over a two year period my mom would like come running into my bedroom or she'd come running into the kitchen and the breakfast nook area. And she'd be like, did you hear that? Did you hear that just now? It sounds like somebody's on the roof. And I'd be like, mom, it's just the wind. She would go and open the front door and turn on the porch light. And the porch light was this stupid naked bulb. So if you were looking up, you couldn't see anything anyways, because the porch light would be blinding you. And I remember there were a couple of times when she was like, come here, I want you to look, I want you to look, you have better eyes. And, and we, we'd go out and I'd be standing in the front yard. I'm like, mom, I don't see anything. It's just the elm tree branches. There's nothing. We had only one old tire on that mobile home roof and it was down by her bedroom. It was on the west end of the mobile home. We should have had four or five or six, but I look back on it now and I wonder, was there really something on the roof? And I know that after I had that experience with that thing in my room, that I kind of, I've heard other people in other podcasts talk about this, that you kind of just, when you're a kid, you just, traumatic stuff, you just kind of push it out of your head and suppress it and not think about it. And I know that I started, we had like, oh, I don't know. My mom had classical records. And then later when I was about 13, we got like the John Williams album for Star Wars. And I would come home from school and my mom wouldn't be home for like another two hours. And I would crank that sucker on the stereo. I became kind of the the door Nazi in that I would go, I the first thing I would do when I'd get home was walk down the hallway, check that back door, double check, make sure it was locked. There were pins in the aluminum window frames, and I would make sure that those little pin locks were locked. So maybe if the window was open, it was only open two or three inches. There was no way anything of any size could get in them. And they all had screens. And I would I would turn all the lights on. And I remember getting into a few arguments with my mom. She would come home and she'd be like, Jesus, honey. She's like, we're going to have a $300 electrical bill. I just, I think that was how I kind of pushed it out, you know, of my mind. We had this thing happen with our cat that was really weird. And I, I could go either way on it. I don't know if it was this, this creature that was in my room or if it was completely unrelated. So our landlord was this 70 plus year old little Basque cowboy and very short, very fat, bow-legged, you know, he grew up riding horses and he and his wife who was dying of cancer 
lived, I think, two weeks out of the month in this little brick house that was to the east of us. It's about a block to the east of us. And he owned like a big chunk of land all around the cemetery. He owned another house next to that that he rented to some, to a school teacher. And then he owned the two lots that we lived on and the one that our neighbor Cheryl and her kids lived on. He had a dog. It was a Queensland Healer Pitbull Cross. It was a monster. The main reason the Bascos had those kind of dogs back then and probably why they have them now is they use them to hunt coyotes. He and his wife spent about two weeks of out of every month on his ranch. He had a ranch out of town somewhere. I don't know where. I don't know how big it was. And then his sons, one of his sons was like a foreman at another, a really big ranch that was about a hundred miles outside of Battle Mountain. So our landlord had this dog named Smokey and he had the coloring of the Queensland healer. He had kind of the fur like one, but he had the head and the muscles and the build of a pit bull. I had seen him kill a border collie that lived across to the north of us. These kids had a blonde and white border collie. I had seen Smokey dismantle that dog. He had killed, uh, somebody had a Pekingese that lived about a block away from us, killed that. There was a retired couple that had a couple of poodles. He killed at least one of the poodles. And then Smokey killed a lot of house cats. Our cat, Freddie, was a, he was a brown and white tabby. Freddie was an indoor-outdoor cat. And he usually spent most of his time, you know, sort of, sleeping on that wooden fence he got hurt he got bit by Smokey at one point I think I was I think I was 12 I think it was about a year later he got bit by Smokey and I don't know how but he got away and he got his leg broken and it was really traumatic and my mom had to like you know bag him up in a blanket she had to take him to the vet they fixed it they fixed his leg they put his leg in a cast and so he was stuck on the sofa in a cast and a lot of pain for a couple of weeks. And he finally got better, got the cast off. And my mom said, that's it. We're keeping him in the house. And that lasted about a week because when house cats decide that they're indoor, outdoor cats, they're going to be indoor, outdoor cats and good luck fighting them on it. So when he was fully healed, my mom was like, screw it, you know? And so if it was during the day and we did not think our landlord was around, we didn't think they were home, she would let him out. And he would, you know, go hunt mice, uh, go into the trailer and hunt mice, lizards. He, he, he would occasionally, he wasn't a really big hunter. I think female cats are much better hunters than male cats. They're just not that really interested in hunting. It's just, more like to play with something. I would say about two months after he had gotten healed up and he was back going outside and climbing the elm trees and stuff, he disappeared. I remember my mom and I, my mom like coming and getting me and saying, you're coming with me. We got to find the damn cat. And we walked all around the vacant lot to the north of us. We walked around the outside of the trailer along the fences like six times. We went over and knocked on the neighbor's door. And our neighbor Cheryl immediately said, well, Smokey probably got him this time. And we looked everywhere. We went a couple blocks away. And I remember my mom walking up and down the dirt alley, you know, yelling, Freddy, Freddy, and couldn't find him. And then about a week after that, my mom came home one day and she said, I was talking to one of the biologists at work. She said, I want you to, you know, go look under the trailer. And I, I had been under the trailer a couple of times because our pipes would freeze in the winter. And I had to, at like 10, 12 years old, I had to put the heating tape on the pipes. I actually had to go under there one time with a butane lighter, a butane torch and thaw them out. I hated it. It was like the seventh level of hell. It was just 
wall to wall black widows scorpions there were probably snakes under there i don't know you know it was just gross and nasty and there were ground squirrels mom said i want you to go look under there i'm wondering if maybe freddie's under there so we took the the skirting off i didn't see anything and mom said well look way in there and i was like shit you know so i'm on my hands and knees and i get about i don't know 10 feet under the mobile home and I found Freddie, and he had been dead for a while. I remember that his neck was snapped, and I remember it was really neat. And I remember thinking, even at the time, at that age, thinking this is weird because Smokey has quite literally eaten cats. Like he's killed small animals in the neighborhood, and somebody finds a paw or a head, or a tail, but they don't find the whole animal, not if it's something, you know, under 10 pounds. I brought him out, and my mom was crying, and she was shaking, and she was furious, and she said it was that damn dog. She said, stupid landlord and a stupid dog, and she said, you know what I think he did? He crawled under here. He said, she said, he, uh, the dog probably killed Freddy, and he was embarrassed, so he took the cat, and he hid the cat under here. And again, at that age, I remember thinking, Mr. S, you think Mr. S has crawled under? 75 years old. He was fat. He wore, a, I never saw him when he didn't have a Stetson hat on. And he was the most bow legged cowboy. You'd, and I, I'm trying to picture this guy getting down on his hands and knees and crawling back through all the spiders and dust and stuff to hide a dead cat. I thought that was so weird at that age. And I really think it's weird now. Yeah. I mean, that's a, that's a tough call, except it is strange with the cleanly broken neck. I mean, I guess yeah. if, if a dog was shaking up a, a cat and it could do that, that's not really what dogs normally. Do. I mean, I've never watched a dog kill a cat. I don't know for sure, but that does seem a little bit strange. And then, of course, it ended up back underneath the house. Uh, it didn't have a broken neck and then crawled there. That's for sure. Yeah, yeah. And why wasn't it eaten? Why wasn't it torn yeah. to shreds? Because that's what that dog normally did. That was his M.O. Oh, so it wasn't really beat up at all. No, it mm -hmm. was just, it was curled up like it was asleep, except I could see that his head was twisted in an angle mm -hmm. and his neck was broken. And I remember thinking, there's no blood. I thought that was weird. I didn't see any handprints in the dust around it other than my own. I thought that was really strange. Back then and to this day, I cannot, for the life of me, picture an elderly fat cowboy getting on his hands and knees and climbing back there to hide the cat. Makes no sense. And the dog, if a dog had done it, the cat would have never made it under there. And if the dog did chase the cat under there, he would have eaten him or at least eaten part of him or just, you know, absolutely shredded him like a rag. And that's not what happened. Well, but, and this will take me to my next uh, portion that I'm going to ask you about, but something five to six feet tall and of slim build might be able to get under there. Right. So here's, here's where I'm going with this. Yeah. You mentioned, and I'm taking you back to when you're actually, you're in the bed and you're screaming bloody murder. You said that you heard a couple of clicks. And to me, that a couple of clicks is what likely probably a couple of toenails. And where I'm going yeah. where I'm yeah. going with this is and this is not that you've ever probably maybe you know offhand because you were there for several years. But if you at eleven years old were standing in that very same spot that, that the Bigfoot was. Do you know how many steps you would have to take from where it was to where your door was? Normally, it was probably about three to four steps from the edge of, from the, the long edge of my bed to from, my front door. I think this thing did it in about two. Yeah, so from where it was standing to where your door was, it would have taken uh -huh. you more steps than it. So, I mean, that's you've kind of already painted that picture as far as this being a juvenile, essentially, right? And that's kind of where I was going with that. It's just kind of driving home like, okay, well, you've got the five to six feet tall, 
uh, slender build, which is not always the a description of a, an adult Bigfoot, even a female. And the fact that it wanted to or and had the desire for whatever reason, which I'm going to ask you about, you're not going to know, but I'm going to ask you anyway, the desire and drive to walk into your home through the back door and stand over you the way that it did seems more like a very reckless juvenile thing to do. Uh, we've heard on other other shows, other stories, that it's these juveniles that are kind of, they're doing the silly stuff. They're doing the stuff that they'd probably get thwacked over the head by mom or dad had mom or dad caught them doing this silly, silly thing. So, okay, so uh, as for as far as the question of why did it come in and stand over your bed? Again, you're not going to know, but I'm going to ask you and, and just see what you think about that. I had a lot of time to think about it. I saw a movie when I, I was living in Seattle. In uh, I, I really like Ridley Scott. And I saw, I think it was Prometheus. It was the first one. And I have that on DVD, DVD or something. And I was watching it. And there's a scene early on in it with the Michael Fassbender character, and he is watching, I can't remember the actress's name, who plays Dr. Shaw in that movie. And she's in sort of cryo sleep on this gigantic spaceship called the Prometheus. She's in cryo sleep, and this, not really a cyborg, this, this robotic per- person played by David is standing over her, watching her sleep. He's, because it's, you know, a science fiction movie, and it's like way in the future, and it's super, super insanely sophisticated, he is able to stand over her, the character of David, and watch Shaw sleep and see her dreams. And so we get a little backstory on the character of Shaw within this sci-fi horror film, and She's t- she's dreaming about talking to her dad when she was a child about her mother dying. And David is like very carefully watching this. And I feel like I wonder now, today, if somehow, some way, by this thing having its arm touch mine, that it was able to, on some level, read my subconscious. And that's why it was in there. And I don't know, I, and I don't remember, you know, whatever I might have been dreaming about before I woke up and had that shock. But I wonder if, if it was, and, and the thing that I, the next day and the day after that, that I completely put out of my mind was the idea that that thing had been in there before, that this was not the first time. And that it was somehow watching my subconscious mind while I slept. And that in order to do that or to facilitate it, it had to be like touching me, like touching my arm with its arm, somehow some sort of physical contact. And that's just a theory. I have remembered, like, since then, I do I do a lot of meditation and stuff. And I was thinking about all of this initially, like three months ago, and just, you know, reminiscing on it and everything and all the stuff around it. I'm not sure, and I'm not 100% on this, but I I guess I'm maybe 20% sure that when I first woke up and I felt this furry thing brushing against my right forearm, that it was humming. And it was very quiet, and it was sort of a monotonous, almost a mechanical sound, just a, but very low and very quiet. When it stood up in that fraction of a second, when I paused my screaming and I looked back at it, I'm not sure, I'm maybe 10 or 20% sure, it had something in its right hand that was glowing. And it kind of looked like, you know how they used to have, well, I guess they still have them, but those room fresheners that you put in bathrooms that like you plug them into the wall and there's some sort of whatever perfume or whatever that comes out that, you know, makes the room smell fresh. But they're also, they also do double time as a nightlight in a bathroom. 
and there's some that are sort of uh, seashell shaped or clam shaped, something like that. I saw this thing, I think I saw this thing that was sort of a dirty yellow color, maybe a yellow gray color in this thing's right hand. And it was about the size, it was sort of large, it was about the size of a wallet. And it was glowing very dimly. And this was all around when this happened, when I woke up with this thing in my room. And then as it was leaving, I, I just for a flash, when I noticed the height of it and the fur on it, the left side, I thought I saw this yellow sort of clamshell looking thing in its right hand. So you're saying only 10 to 20 percent sure because you're thinking that. Yeah, there could not 100 be... percent. I, I don't. I mean, you know, the fact that it was humming, the fact that it had something in its hand, I did not initially register that or remember that immediately after and for several years after. I didn't. I was just thinking about it one time. I was meditating. I was like, did it in its hand when it was leaving the room? It was kind of like that. So you're kind of wondering if it's an artifact that your memory kind of pushed in there, like kind of added in right. almost. Okay. Well, I don't. I don't know if I added it or if I just suppressed it or didn't remember it. You know, yeah. the whole experience from start to finish was so fast. But I have always been kind of, I don't know, super observant, maybe hyper vigilant. I had some trauma not related to any of this uh, as a kid, uh, not not anything sexual or whatever, but I had some trauma and I, I had some trauma as an adult. I'm the kind of person that I, I, I studied uh, graphic arts when I was like 19. I thought I was going to do that before I then ended up switching to journalism I had an art teacher years and years ago uh, this was when I was living in Elko that she would have somebody come in walk through and then walk out and then she'd say okay what color was his t-shirt what kind of shoes was he wearing was he wearing tennis shoes was his hair red was it blonde what color were his eyes about how tall was he and she used to do this thing, and she had been briefly in the 60s or 70s, she had been a like a like a mock-up artist for the San Francisco PD. And so she would have us do this do this stuff while we were in the life drawing class. And it was kind of fun. And I remember this was this was in the mid-80s. And I remember I always like, I don't know if she actually graded us, but I always sort of got A's. Do you know what I'm saying? Because I was like really observant. With this thing coming in as close as it did, I mean, it could have also gone to visit your mother. Have you ever thought about, how did your mom sleep? I mean, because to me, you had been screaming for a while and it kind of took her a while to go in there. Did she also sleep like a log? Like, do you ever think, oh, I wonder if well, if, if it ever went in and visited my mom at all, you know, because you were wondering if Apparently it if had come did. to see you too. Yeah. She did that night. My mother absolutely firmly and flatly always said it was a nightmare. You have a really vivid, def you know, really vivid imagination. You draw stuff. You love reading science fiction novels. You love watching TV, reading, drawing movies. You know, later on, a couple of years later, it was Star Wars and everything. She said it's, it was a nightmare. It was a nightmare or a bad dream. And then I remember... I don't I guess I was 12 or 13. It was like a year or two later. Uh, yeah, it was when I was 13. My oldest brother, who lived up in, he's lived in Washington State for like 40 some years now. He came and visited us. He was, he was a fan of the cannabis from way back. And I remember him sitting in our living room and my mom was at work and I was talking to him and, and he was, he was lighting up a bong and I said, I said to him, I said, there was a Sasquatch in, there was a Bigfoot in my room. And I remember him just laughing and laughing and laughing and saying, kid, a Bigfoot wouldn't fit in your room. It's too small. So I, it was always met with, you know, come on, you had a nightmare. 
And I, I think I might have said something to one or two of my friends at school about it. They thought I was nuts. And so, like I said, I just kind of suppressed all of this for a really, really long time because I got tired of being laughed at about it. I can imagine that. And I'm something else that you had already said that I made sure to jot down was, you know, checking that back door. I bet you did that all the time. I mean, looking back on it now, looking back on it now, though, how do you feel about this i mean are you happy that this occurred would you you know if you lived out in the middle of nowhere in the woods now would you want this to ever happen again because it was such a unique experience i don't think i'm as afraid of it as i was i think that if you were outside and you saw one of these it wouldn't be as intimidating as if they actually got into your home i i plan on, I've got a vehicle that I'm getting in good running order. I plan on just hiking around Washington State this summer. You know, if I see any signs, I, I certainly will be vigilant. I will certainly be hyper vigilant and looking around. If I see tracks or if I see, you know, trees broken a certain way, I'm gonna go. I'm going to go camping. I'm not adverse to it now. The thing that always stuck with me and my argument has from, I don't know, from way back when, my argument has always been this. And I think I'm not 100% sure, but I think I said something similar to this to my mom the night that it happened was, okay, I got an overactive imagination. It came out of my subconscious. It was a nightmare or a bad dream. Where are the glowing red eyes? Why didn't it have gigantic fangs? If it was a demon from hell, why wasn't it trying to choke me? Why wasn't it, you know, behaving in a threatening or aggressive manner to me? Because its facial expression was 100% the opposite of that. It was curious. There was no, absolutely no malevolence or evil in that face it was just curious it was just really curious and its facial expression when i woke up its eyes got larger it was like oh shit she's awake that literally was its facial expression it was this incredibly human facial expression and i i just don't there's no way this thing was in any way aggressive or meant me ill harm you know i had a friend actually back in the late nineties when I was still in Reno before I moved to Seattle, because I lived in Seattle for nine years and now I'm over here in Eastern Washington. And I had a friend that was from Southern California that lived in Reno. And she and I were talking on the phone one night. I somehow the subject of this story came up and I think, I think she was telling me about one of her ex-husbands had had an encounter or something in the Sierras I said, well, there was one in my room when I was a kid and I told her the story and she said to me, she said, you know what I think it was? I think it was some pervy cowboy in your neighborhood that probably saw this cute little girl. You know, he snuck in there that night and you probably know what he was doing. And I immediately said, how would he have gotten out of there? How on earth could something, could an actual human being, so a guy, he's a pervert, I'm a little girl, I'm 11 years old, he's drunk or sober or what have you, probably in cowboy boots, sneak into my room, get out of my room in a matter of, what, three seconds, 10 seconds, and not run head on into my mother, who was coming out of her bedroom and coming down the hallway to mine. I I just said that there's no way, there's no way that a human dude, sober, drunk, could have moved that fast. If it had been some pervert, he would have run face first into my mother. So, but that brings up a good point, though. So you, but to you, the timing would have been that she should have seen this creature coming out of your room before it got to that back door? Apparently she didn't. Hmm. And I don't know. I The only thing I can figure is took her, you know, 30 seconds or a minute 
or so to stagger out of bed. I remember, I remember her being mad at me because she knocked one of her lamps over. She went, she, you know, she had end tables and she had lamps on either side of the queen size bed. And she went to turn one over or turn one on and she was half asleep and it came off the end table. And that was the crashing noise I heard, you know, the everything falling. And I'm thinking that if that happened and she stopped to pick it up, turn on the light, then open her door. This thing was moving so fast. That was enough time for it to get out. Well, they move quick. We do know that. Now, Mel, and, and you may Definitely. not know this, but were you aware of Bigfoot in any way, shape or form prior to this? The You know, the Patterson-Gimlin film that had already gone down. And of course, there was no Internet back then, of course. But were you aware of Bigfoot in any way, shape or form? The only thing I knew was from the $6 million man with the bionic Bigfoot. And that thing, I believe, was played by Andre the Giant for a little while. I was, I was aware of that. I, like I said, I'd, I'd never even heard the word Sasquatch until I was 20s or something. I, I just remember the $6 million man. Then I remember, I think it was when I was 12 or 13, like a year or two later, I think I was 12. Well, no, wait, 13. God, I can't remember. We went to, we took, a, my mom had a vacation. We took a road trip to Utah and we went to a cinema and we saw Star Wars. And I seem to remember her saying something, you know, kind of flippantly. And we were getting in the car after the movie. And it was an awesome movie, you know. It was amazing. And we were getting in the car, and my mom said, so that big hairy thing, did that look like what you saw in your room? And I was like, huh? And I had to sit there for a minute and, and think, because I had, like, so totally suppressed the memory. And I said, what, the big brown red? No, no. The thing I saw was small and black. So that's it. I didn't. I don't remember reading any books that had, you know, I, I was a voracious reader and I don't remember reading any books that had Sasquatches or Bigfoots in them. I mean, we were reading, when I was 11, we were reading The Hobbit, which, yeah, they got furry feet, but mostly they just look like really short people, like dwarves. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> Yeah, no worries. Just wondering. Yeah, thank you for answering that. Well, Mel, thank you so much for reaching out and for being willing to come on and share. It's a really unique encounter, and uh, and I'm happy that uh, that you came here to share it. I appreciate that. And everybody, go check out Mel Murphy on Amazon and her fictional works. Mel, thank you. Thank you very much, Shannon.